Welcome to the third webinar in Washington State's OSPI's Expert Webinar Series, provided in partnership with Glean Education. Next slide, please. This Expert Webinar Series is part of a larger initiative between Washington State OSPI and Glean Education to build educator capacity to deliver structured literacy within an MTSS framework in our state. To learn more, please visit the links in the chat. This webinar is being recorded and you can find the presenter's slides and handouts in the Padlet link in the chat. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our organizational partner in this work, Glean Education and their founder and CEO, Jessica Hammond. Next Thank slide, you. Please. Thank you, Rebecca. Glean Education is thrilled to be partnering with Washington State's Department of Education, OSPI, for this initiative. For those of you who do not yet know us, Glean Education partners with schools, districts, and states to deliver the online training and web-based coaching. We help teachers understand current research and implement evidence-based literacy practices to improve student literacy outcomes. You can learn more at gleaneducation.com or visit us on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter at Glean Education. Next slide, please. This webinar is the third in a series of webinars this year on structured literacy within an MTSS framework, featuring some, in, some of the nature's, nation's top experts in the field. If you haven't registered for them yet, we will be putting the link in the chat so you can register there. Attendees who register and attend the full webinar are eligible for one clock hour per webinar. Next slide, please. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Emerson Dickman, a practicing attorney for nearly 50 years. Emerson Dickman has been an advocate for individuals with disabilities and their families, handling cases that protect the due process rights of pupils in special education and the constitutional rights of adults with developmental disabilities. He is past president of the International Dyslexia Association, IDA, a founding board member of the past of and past secretary of the Alliance for Accreditation and Certification of Structured Language Education, and a former member of the National Joint Committee on Learning Disabilities. He is also on the board of numerous professional advisory organizations, including the Children's Dyslexia Centers and the National Center for Learning Disabilities. And he has received numerous honors, including the 2012 Margaret Bird Rawson Lifetime Achievement Award from IDA. Please help me in welcoming Emerson Dickman. Thank you, Jessica. That was very nice. I appreciate that very much. You know, when I was um, preparing this presentation, it occurred to me that unlike other presentations, I'm not here to tell anybody what they don't already know. In other words, this audience knows pretty much everything that I'm going to say. What I'm going to do from the perspective of an advocate, a parent advocate most of the time, is to indicate how that knowledge can be communicated with parents and sometimes students in a way that you can garner their cooperation and collaboration in the whole educational process. This 40 minutes or so could easily be a two-day workshop. So I'm going to just hit the high points as we go along. First, I'm going to explain very briefly how learning disabilities can be explained to parents and even children. We'll discuss the predictable progression of what happens when a learning disability goes untreated. Yeah, then I'll explain dyslexia and the current definition of dyslexia. We'll, we'll talk about how to describe informed intervention in a way that can be understood and accepted by parents and others that don't know as much as the educator might know. And we'll talk about promoting partnership between the educator and the parents. The partnership is incredibly important in uh, arriving at a collaborative environment where the parents can be part of the process in reinforcing 
what the school district is providing to the child. I'll talk about Cecil dust, which is, is something that I made up <laughs> and turning pessimism into optimism. What is reflective practice and how we can use that in determining you know, what we should be saying and how to say it and what the initial conference with a parent looks like and what it, what it could look like and what alternatives there might be. Lastly, we'll talk about, or I'll talk about my impression of the keys to success. What makes a successful child and what can we do to um, achieve that success? First, explaining learning disability. Uh, as Jessica indicated, I was a member of the Professional Advisory Board of the National Center uh, of the NJCLD, National Joint Committee on Learning Disabilities, which was, which is an organization full of scientists and researchers. I was one of the very few that was not a scientist and researcher that meet every twice a year to prepare white papers that address issues of interest to the industry the, the edu the, in special education. I turned to the scientist one day sitting next to me after a couple of years, and I said, you know, we have these things on our chest that say we're members of the National Joint Committee on Learning Disabilities. So what, what do you say when somebody comes up to you in an elevator on the hallway? You know, what is a learning disability? And John, he's a professor at the University of Virginia. He turned, turned away from me for a second and gave it a lot of thought, more thought than I, than I expected, as a matter of fact. And he turned back to me after a couple of minutes and said, well, learning disability is a term we invented in order to help children in need. And I thought that was a really excellent, you know, definition of why we have the term, but I was still uh, concerned about who are these children in need. So for another year and a half, I corresponded this time by email with uh, approximately 30 researchers, scientists, and practitioners uh, throughout the United States. And after about a year and a half, we came up with this construct. Learning disabilities reflect natural variations. It's not a disorder or an anomaly of some kind, a natural variation in brain function that predict unexpected difficulty learning skills and concepts that are valued by the culture in which the individual is expected to perform. We, they also, you know, came up with the fact that learning disabilities can coexist, but are distinct from variations in achievement due to other causes, such as the lack of education or a brain injury, etc. Secondary consequences, as we all know, can include diminished sense of self-confidence and self-efficacy or, and sometimes social marginalization. Importantly, it was also determined that appropriate instruction can make learning disabilities less severe. That is a critical issue. This is something we can talk to parents about. This is something that we know and that parents may not. They think of a learning disability as a disorder. Jack Fletcher, who's one of the top people in the field at the present time and has been for a long time, has said there are neurobiological factors that make people at risk for a disability. However, neural systems are malleable and the predictably concomitant disability can often be prevented by exposing the child to appropriately differentiated instructional programs. Now, this paragraph has two major characteristics that are important. A learning disability initially indicates simply that a child is at risk for a disability, does not at that point actually have a disability. They're at risk for a disability. And of course, that if they're treated effectively, 
that neural systems are malleable and can be changed and thereby prevent the predictable disability. Okay, it's an important concept that, that needs to be conveyed. A so-called learning disability is not a disability in and of itself, but simply a neurobiological factor that places the individual at risk for a disability. Natural variations, by the way, because of the time limitations, I have to stick a lot closer to my slides than I usually do. So the anecdotes and the incredibly funny jokes that I usually <laughs> include, um, I'm going to have to leave out in order to get all this done within the time frame that we have available to us today. But natural variations in brain function also account for variations in things like artistic and athletic talent. So this is the kind of thing that you can use to describe to parents. The fact that a, a child has uh, a delay in learning how to read is no different than, you know, he's, uh, listen, I can't dance and I can't sing and my musical talent is, you know, below zero. <laughs> Therefore, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially the same thing, whether it's an artistic talent or an athletic talent or a talent that's related to learning how to read. It's a natural variation in brain function. 300 years ago, think of it. A sense of direction was important. Now we have a GPS on our phone. It tells us, you know, what's around the block and how to get there. And we've all decided or don't use sense of direction anymore. Think about eye-hand coordination 300 years ago, how important that was. How important is it today? Whereas the ability to read and write today is extremely important. 300 years ago, it wasn't as important as eye-hand coordination or sense of direction. Predictable progression of untreated learning disabilities. This is something I talk about a lot. We're going to try to do it very briefly here. Stage one, the child has a learning disability, which is simply an indication that they're at risk for a disability. Stage two is learning disability plus failure. Now, in our current approach to identifying children for special education, very often we use an aptitude achievement discrepancy formula or a wait to see approach that is really harmful because now we're dealing, once we identify the child that has a need, we're not only dealing with a learning disability, but we're dealing with a child who has a learning disability and has also experienced failure. The goal should be to find and fix, not to wait and see. Stage three, is a learning disability plus failure minus effort and motivation. Now, why at this stage is effort and motivation such a problem for a ch the child? Well, it's explained very often through the process of psychological process of cognitive dissonance. These are children whose failure is unexpected. Therefore, their environment is constantly telling them that they can do it if they try. They're really very smart. And unfortunately, when they look at other children who they consider to be their peers, they see that the other children are doing better than they are. So the dissonance is a one belief in how smart they are and another belief in maybe I'm not so smart. So this dissonance we know causes psychological pain. And in order to defend against that pain, the children very often begin to avoid challenges. Therefore, for a simple example, let's say there's a test coming up. I know children that, you know, don't study for the test. They rather sit on the edge of their bed staring at a wall all night long. And the next morning, they feel terrible that they didn't study for the test and they go in and they fail the test. And they don't know why, because it's all subconscious. 
It's a defensive reaction to the pain of cognitive dissonance. And I have a very good friend who's a neuropsychologist who once said to me, and it's perfect, is these are children that would rather be seen as unwilling than unable. Unwilling than unable. They can stay smart as long as they don't try. Okay. And what we need, what happens then is they begin to feel over time that things are happening to them as a result of forces beyond their control. Now, that is the definition of something we call an external locus of control. And when a child has an external locus of control or doesn't feel that they can make things happen, they are become hypervigilant, they become concerned about changes and transitions, and they're looked upon very often as being anxious. And when a child is anxious long enough, very often they're looked upon as being depressed. One of the reasons, now if I had a live audience in front of me, I would have some people that would be nodding their head, which would make me feel great, and I'd have, and I'd be able to ask the question, is this something that makes sense to you? Because yes, you know, the audience usually will respond back to me that this is something that is logical. They see children like this every day. One of the reasons I have these little circles or whatever they are here is to indicate that each stage is exponentially more difficult to treat than the previous stage. When we have a child who has, this is another one of my infographics, when they have a child who is anxious and depressed, which is a psychological reaction to being hypervigilant and fearful, okay, we have to deal with that because that's what's paramount at this time. And then we go down to the external locus of control, which is a psychological reaction to the lack of effort and motivation, which is the behavioral response to dissonance or the pain of dissonance, et cetera. Does this, I, you know, with a live audience, I would look at the audience and I'd say, does this make sense? You know, because it, it does to me because I've seen it happen with children over the years. And the problem here is we have to work through these areas in order to get back to the learning disability, which was the key that started the whole thing off. Explaining dyslexia. In the United States, up to 80% of children with a learning disability have a difficulty learning how to read that we often refer to as dyslexia. So what is dyslexia? I am going to, this is something that is audience participation. Now I can see four people here <laughs> instead of however many are listening to this. So you're gonna be on your honor. I want everybody to read this sentence out loud with me. If you're at home in a room, somebody might think you're a little crazy, but I want you to read this out loud with me. Now, finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to, I don't know what it means, by the way. So I'm not going to ask you what it means, but I want you to count the number of ends in that sentence. Count the number of ends in that sentence. I'll give you a minute while I take a sip. Okay, it's a pretty easy task. So how many people counted four ends? Hold up your, your hand. If you have so every most everybody, I assume, and when I do this for a bigger for a big audience, just about everybody gets it right. Yes, four ends. Very good. Okay, now we'll do another practice. I want you to quickly uh, count how many F's are in this sentence. How many F's are in this sentence?
Did you have enough time to count the Fs? Okay. Hold up how many fingers you have showing how many Fs you counted. So the three people that I'm looking at now are four people. Three Fs, three, three Fs. Oh, somebody counted four Fs. Wow. Okay. When I give this test, and it's in your handout, so you can give it to your friends and your family, 90% at least of the audience counts three Fs. Some count four Fs. Some count five. Some even count six Fs. See how many there are. Whoops. There's six Fs. So if you counted three Fs, which I am assuming that most of you did, because that's my experience over the years, I also asked the audience, why do you think you only counted three Fs in spite of the fact that there are six in this sentence? And the answer I most often get initially is that because the word of is a very small word and we skipped over it. You know, we're good readers. We all skipped over it. I, when I was reading it, I even emphasized the ofs when we read it out loud. The answer is that as a reader, if you weren't a reader, you would have counted six Fs with no problems whatsoever. Or if this was in a foreign language, you would have counted six Fs, no problem whatsoever. But because you were a reader, you were making the symbol to sound correspondence automatically. So you were looking for the F sound, which usually, usually is the unvoiced fricative that is found in the words finished, files, and scientific. So the V sound, the voice fricative in of, you skipped over because you were looking for the sound, not the symbol. Very often in learning disabilities, we find that some things that we assume are counterintuitive. Skilled readers activate the speech areas of the brain. Jean Chal said once, the blind are better readers than the deaf. This happens because reading is closer to hearing than to seeing. So very often we get a lot of information about what we should do to, you know, you know, improve our eyesight because that's interfering with our ability to learn to read. But no, reading is closer to hearing than it is to seeing. Okay, the definition of dyslexia. Well, I'll try to tell the story very quickly. In 1990, I think it was, my wife and I were coming back from an IDA conference in Washington, and we had seen many or many researchers talking about what was going on, and every single one of them was using a different definition of dyslexia to identify the cohort of students that they were investigating. When I came back, I did some additional research and found that in research that was being funded by the NIH and through NICHD, there were 21 different definitions of dyslexia being used. So after about three years, kind of a situation similar to what I did with the construct of, of learning disabilities, but this was three years and this was letters you know, <laughs> instead of emails, we came up with a definition. It was very simple, but in 1994, it was adopted by the National Institutes of Child Health and Human uh, human development and used in research throughout the United States and Canada for eight years to bring that research together. And in 2002, we reconvened the scientific consensus meeting to come up with a definition. And this was the definition that is currently, you know, used in legislation in well over 40 states in the United States. Dyslexia is a specific learning disability. It is neurobiological in origin. It is characterized by difficulty with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from, from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is often unexpected 
in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom and instruction. So dystichia is not a reason for dyslexia or the lack of education. Secondary consequences, and this is important, may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. Now, it's a long definition, and each sentence has one or two things that need to be explained. And it could take, you know, and some people have written uh, articles on it that are 18, 20 pages long. What I tried to do was put it together in an infographic, and this infographic is being used by uh, by others. It's been reprinted in books and stuff like that. But I think it, for me, it makes it much more simpler to understand. A deficit in processing the phonological component of language impacts directly the ability to decode, spell, be accurate, and be fluent. Now, one of the things, and I know that everybody that's listening to this knows this already, but decoding is, and this is if you're explaining to parents, is the skill to decipher letters and letter combinations into speech sounds. Whereas encoding is the opposite, it's spelling. The ability to represent speech sounds and letters and uh, with letters and letter combinations. Accuracy, is the ability to easily identify single words without error, okay? Fluency is reading that sounds, and this is Suzanne Carricker has said this, and I, I like it, reading that sounds as if the reader is speaking and allows the reader to focus on meaning. Now, very often we stop intervention when a child becomes accurate but not necessarily fluent. And you can explain this to parents by indicating that this is what a child sounds like when they're being accurate. Um, the ability to identify single words without errors. So I'm accurate, I'm reading, but am I understanding what I'm reading? Fluency is you're using prosody, the punctuation makes a difference in how you sound. And when I'm reading that, with reading with fluency, it sounds just like Suzanne said, like you're speaking, reading. That sounds as if the reader is speaking and allows the reader to focus on meaning. So now not, we're not only looking at and understanding the meaning of the words involved, but the meaning of the sentence and the paragraph, et cetera. So stopping intervention before a child becomes fluent simply because they've become accurate is too soon. Now, secondarily, if you're having a problem in any one of these four areas, it's going to impact comprehension because you're, you're lacking the ability to access word meaning or in the case of fluency, the meaning of the sentence. You're also, or the child is also going to be reading less than other children with similar potential and similar uh, intelligence. And if you read less, you're going to develop, your, your vocabulary and background knowledge is not going to develop at the same rate as other children with similar potential. And comprehension depends greatly on vocabulary and background knowledge. So if a person with dyslexia is going to have problems with comprehension that are secondary to the difficulties or the deficit in processing the phonological component of language. Now, children that are relatively good decoders, in other words, this line they have down pat, but they're having difficulty with comprehension are often referred to as having a developmental language disorder. They have problems with comprehension versus with decoding, spelling, accuracy, and fluency. Now, 
children with dyslexia, from what I understand from current research, about 50% also have some developmental language disorders. And children with developmental language disorders also, about 50% of them, have difficulty processing the phonological component of language or dyslexia. So these two disabilities overlap. Louisa Motes has said that when students struggle with spelling, they often write fewer words, shorter sentences, and less complex ideas and then, than they may be able to communicate orally. Now, teachers and, and anybody in education, you know, personally, I'm sure you, you can see this um, in the students that you see. Bert Backrack, and I'm, you know, when I first used this quote many years ago, um, everybody knew who Bert Backrack is, and now not everybody does, but I'll explain that in a minute, has said a synonym is a word you, you, you use when you can't spell the word you first thought of. Okay, I like that in particular. Bert Backrack is a singer, is a singer, songwriter, pianist, etc. He wrote songs, Look of Love, Do You Know the Way to San Jose, Raindrops Be Called Falling on Your Head, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that explains who Bird is. Disturbing facts. Okay. Average is between the 25th and the 75th percentile. So a child who is in the low average area going into grade 10 at the 25th percentile is reading at the same rate as a child who is average reading at the 75th percentile halfway through the fifth grade. There's almost a four year difference there. So average, depending upon the child, average may not be the goal that we are looking for in a particular child. The top 10th percentile read more in the first two days of school than the bottom 10th percentile read in the whole year. And this, this is within the area of average. The 70th percentile reader is exposed to five times as many words as the 30th percentile reader it makes a big difference in terms of developing vocabulary, background knowledge, et cetera. For educators, now this is another thing that comes up a lot is educators are concerned that parents are very, um, uh, you know, critical of them because the educator doesn't want to spend money, blah, 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 you know, all that kind of thing. But you know, for an educator to look at the parent and say, no, we, you know, waiting one year, we know that research shows that waiting one year diminishes the effectiveness of what we're going to do by 25 or 50%. That is not something we want to do. We want to make progress as soon as possible, you know, and we don't want to wait. And as a matter of fact, the return on investment of timely intervention is 16 to $31 for each dollar spent. You know, I see that one of the uh, researchers here is Sharon Vaughn, who's going to be a later speaker in this session. These are three studies that show that. Return on investment is very significant. So as far as the parent is concerned, when they start talking about you know, what you're doing and why you're delaying doing it, et cetera. You know, the educator, we have, can say we have no reason to delay intervention because we actually save money by intervening early and effectively. Explaining informed intervention. What is informed intervention? Informed intervention requires three things. It requires a method that is scientifically evidence-based, hopefully, and field tested and has a track record of success. It, it requires an instructor that has sufficient training to deliver the method of instruction as it's intended to be delivered with fidelity to design. And it is, uh, has to be delivered with sufficient dosage 
to make a difference. Dosage is the intensity and duration of instruction. If you have the best method in the world, you know, or a great method and a terrific instructor, and you're only doing it 20 minutes, three times a week, it's not going to make a significant difference. Okay, but this is this is what informed instruction is. And there's no reason not to discuss this directly also with parents because they know it, you know it. The key is dosage. This is Timothy Shanahan. Any of these names that here you you may know, you you probably read articles, even if you don't remember their names, you probably read have read articles that they've written or read their research. Dosage, such a critical component of effective and appropriate instruction, and so challenging to get it right. Uh, Joe Torgus and Barbara Foreman and Rick Wagner said serious reading difficulties can be prevented in most students if the right kind of instruction is provided with sufficient intensity early in development. It's important to jump on it right away. Hollis Scarborough, many of you who are listening to this have seen Hollis's reading rope. I mean, there's very few people that do a presentation anymore about reading that don't use Hollis's reading rope to explain what reading is all about. She has said Interven in intervention studies, the key to meaningful effect size is intensity. It's important to get it right. You can't just do a little bit of this and hope that it's going to happen. Uh, it's going to work out. So promoting partnership. I promised I would tell you what I thought of Cecil Dust. I knew uh, Cecil Mercer was a uh, well-known researcher and scientist in the field of reading and a wonderful man. And I say was because he's unfortunately no longer with us. But when you met Cecil in a hallway and said, you know, hi, Cecil, how are you doing? He would stop and he'd look up and he'd think and he'd say something like, well, yesterday I played golf with my grandson and he's a really terrific golfer. And this morning I finished an article that I've been working on for four months and it's off my back now. I feel, you know, it's great. And tomorrow my wife and I are taking the day off and just going to have fun. And how are you doing? And he would make everybody feel great. He felt great. You feel great, et cetera. You know, happiness, goodwill, and trust are contagious. It's hard to dislike someone who is happy. A good attitude promotes good attitudes. When a parent comes in to see you, you know, a, you know, very often I will go in and I will see somebody and I'll say, oh, this is my third IEP today. I don't know if I can do it through another one, you know, et cetera, et cetera. No, you, this is what you lived your life for. You're, you're there to help children. You're there to help parents, et cetera. You, you feel great. You're always in a good mood and you're very happy you're doing what you're doing. And that gives parents a feeling of trust and goodwill right off the bat. Never have a bad day. <laughs> Turning pessimism into optimism. I call this tricks, but they're really not tricks. It's just common sense that I'm sure you've used as well. But to Anne, you know, you'll get people who will make a statement like, especially with children with learning disabilities, he's very smart, like I said before, but he's unmotivated. Okay, that, that's a statement that could come from the parent. It's a statement that could come from the educator as well. Wouldn't it be better to do something like say, he's very smart and with a little more confidence, his motivation will improve. And we are going to work on his self-confidence. There's a lot out there to help us do that. There's the work of um, uh, Dr. Robert Brooks, the work of Dr. Uh, of uh, Rick Lavoie, et cetera. It's all there and it can help us you know, do that. The other thing is you have, you know, a parent comes in and says, my child can't read. The response should say, up until now he couldn't read, but we're going to address that. We're going to do something about that. And this is how we're going to do it. 
Reflective practice. Reflective practice is something else. It is, you know, if you think about it, common sense. In short, reflective practice is a process of self-evaluation to anticipate how your actions are prompting the reactions of others. Use theory of mind. Theory of mind is, you know, how is the other person going to think about or respond to what I am saying or doing? Okay. If you think about what they, how they're going to respond to what you say, you might change what you say or how you say it. Basically, it's the golden rule. Am I treating others as I would like to be treated? What if I was a parent coming into a situation like this? Yes, parents have a micro perspective. In other words, they're talking about one particular child, whereas the educator has a macro perspective. You have to think about all the children for which you're responsible. But that doesn't mean that when you're dealing with a parent, you can't respond to their micro concerns with, you know, you know, uh, a micro response. Trust. Earning the trust of parents is really very important. First, value your relationship. Basically, you can make the um, argument that, you know, we want to help your child. We want to educate your child. We want to, you know, et cetera. But we can't do it without your help, you know? Show that you understand and that you care about their concerns. Communicate honestly, of course. Inform and educate. Admit your weaknesses. Do what you promise. Do what you believe to be right, always. You'll never be criticized by doing what you believe to be right. The best way to be trusted is to trust in return. You know, it's not, very often I see people that expect to be trusted without trusting those who they, they wish to trust them. This is a little bit specific. We'll talk about initial conference with parents. I have been doing this, like Jessica said, for almost 50 years and have been at hundreds and hundreds of IEP meetings. And basically, and this is, you know, uh, the conversation goes something like this. We have just completed comprehensive testing and have found some issues that need to be addressed, of course. But do not worry. We have professional staff that are experienced and able to provide the needed services. We will establish reasonable goals in an IEP, implement appropriate interventions, monitor progress, and let you know how we feel about the success of our efforts every couple of months. We are the experts in this field. We know what we're doing. Trust us. Now that sounds very reasonable and it is truthful, but it is, if you think about it, it is not really addressing the concerns of the parents. If this was a conversation, for instance, with an oncologist, you would want to know more. Trust us would not be sufficient. For instance, you might want to know, you know, what are you going to do? Who's going to do it? Has he done it before? Has he or she done it before? The parent is unfortunately often expected to sit back and let the educators do their job without further inquiry. The result is a parent who is uninformed, anxious, and a Monday morning quarterback. They're going to be looking over your shoulder, wondering what you're doing and why you're doing it, and why isn't their child making more progress than he is making, even if he is making sufficient progress. Okay, alternatively, you can value the parent's concerns, educate the parent as to what is wrong and what needs to be done, engage the parents by involving them in the process. Value, educate, engage. Value, educate, engage. For example, testing has revealed the concern that unless properly treated in a timely fashion, could have consequences regarding Jimmy's future potential and happiness. Are we really saying anything the parent isn't thinking? 
in this sentence? Absolutely not. The parent is thinking this. We might as well say it right up front. Okay, we found that Jimmy has a relative. This is an example, of course. We have found that Jimmy has a relative weakness in processing the phonological component of language. That's commonly referred to as dyslexia. Dyslexia is not a disability in the usual sense of the word, but a natural variation in brain function, not unlike variations in other abilities like artistic or athletic talent. So you're telling the parent, your child is not disabled in the normal sense of the word, but your child has, you know, this, this uh, variation in brain function, just like, you know, talent in music or athlete, uh, athletics. However, it can affect the development of literacy skills, which at this time and in this culture are highly valued, okay? For intervention to be successful, it needs to be informed on three levels. We just went through that. The method should reflect the science of reading, you know, et cetera. So you say something like, we use a structured literary, literacy approach known as, you know, fill in the blank. The instructor should have sufficient knowledge, experience, and training to deliver the method as intended. You're educating the, the the parent as to what is needed. And then you're saying, we're going to do that. Mrs. Smith is certified, named the organization, and has specific training in the program we're using, or whatever the case may be. Such interventions need to be delivered with sufficient intensity to evidence meaningful progress. We suggest that three times per week for 45 minutes per session should be sufficient. However, we're going to monitor progress every two weeks. We're going to track progress over a six to nine week period to ascertain whether we are on path to achieve the intended goal. And we're going to adjust the intensity or character of, invent, or of intervention as necessary. Okay? Then you invite the parents to collaborate. Our efforts will not be successful as we would hope without your collaboration and partnership. This is how you can help. Now, this is a list I just made here. You can, you know, educators make their own list. There's a, many things, but for instance, if possible, read for 20 minutes every day with Jimmy in a book suggested by Ms. Smith. You read one paragraph, let Jimmy read the next paragraph. Let Jimmy see you reading on your own and discussing with others what you've read. Keep abreast of what is going on in Ms. Smith's class or what she is focusing on so that you can reinforce when the opportunities present themselves, you know, outside of school. Keep us informed, and this is very important. If there's any change in Jimmy's attitude towards school, for better or for worse, Okay, if a parent feels that they are collaborators and partners in addressing the educational needs of their child, they will focus on successes more than failures. They'll try to see success. Think, well, you know, there's, there's a lot I could discuss, but there's not always the time available. But think about the fact that there, if, if you pay for something, you expect to get what you pay for. If a, if a parent sends a child to an expensive private school, they're going to be looking for how good the school is doing, not how bad the school is doing. You know, it's just sensible that, you know, it's just logical that we expect to get what we pay for. So in this particular case, if they are contributing to the process, they are now vested in the success of that process and not concerned about the possibility of failure. Keys to success. Very often I'm asked because I'm dyslexic myself, how I made it through college and law school. And you know, I tell you know, students that what you do for yourself is more important than what others do for you. Make eye contact, take good notes, arrive to class early. You know, 15 seconds before the professor gets there is worth a half a grade. 
you know, <laughs> highlight, outline, focus on concepts, come to class prepared, manage your time. And then I used to have one more thing added to this list. And then I realized that if you do this last thing, the other things are almost automatic. You know, sit in front. If you sit in front, you make eye contact, you take notes, you, you, you know, et cetera. Um, that's very important. So what I suggest that teachers do is invite the student to sit in front. Say to Jimmy or whoever, I, I read your IEP last night and I understand you're having difficulty learning how to read. If you sit in front, I promise I won't call on you unless you raise your hand. And I will answer any questions you have after school if that is, if, if, if that is what you wish. Um, how many students are going to say no to that? And how many teachers are going to refuse to do something like that? Very, very few. And if a child with a disability, like dyslexia, sits in front, they're going to learn. I know when I was in, in, uh, in middle school, I would sit in the back of the class behind the biggest kid I could find so that the teacher couldn't see me, but the teacher found me anyhow. Okay, children who feel empowered wear their self-confidence like a suit of armor that attracts others because of its beauty and shields from harm because of its strength. You know, it is our goal to empower, you know, children. This is something, you know, if you, if you express this to parents, this is my goal in life is to empower, empower your child, you know, to make them successful. The keys to success from my perspective is initiative, the willingness to start something, persistence, the willingness to, you know, keep at it until it's complete, and the resilience to try again and the occasion that you fail. Failure is how we learn. We don't really learn as much through success as we do through failure. So failure is okay. Um, I, because of my math background, because I was better in math than I was in reading, um, I can add initiative, persistence, and resilience, and I think they add up to passion. If we can develop passion in a child, then they can overcome almost any adversity. Dyslexia is not a gift. Promoting exceptionalism in every child is a shared goal of parents and educators. Parents and educators can make it possible for all children to explore their strengths by lighting the fires of passion without requiring that they suffer the challenge of adversity. Takeaways. Every human being experiences variations in brain function. Only those variations that impact adaptive functioning are meaningful. Those variations that in adaptive functioning are things that are of value to our culture. Reading is an important adaptive function that develops over time. Reading relies more on hearing than on seeing. Dyslexia is neither a gift nor a curse. Failure is not a prerequisite. Delayed intervention results in predictable emotional consequences. To be effective, intervention must be informed times three. Value, educate, and engage the parent. The best way to be trusted is to trust in return. And the empowered child is the successful child. Thank you very much. Okay, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Well, thank you so much, Emerson, for that wonderful presentation. And we indeed do have a few minutes for questions and we will be getting to them shortly. I just wanted to point uh, the participants attention to the link in the chat, which is the survey link. So if you could open that up and fill out the survey briefly, that would be wonderful. And uh, it helps with attendance for clock hours as well. So now on to the questions. Let's dig in. 
Um, one of the first questions we got was, what do you suggest when a parent asks for a specific program in their child's IEP meeting? Okay, well, this, like I expected, there's a lot of questions that have very complex answers. I mean, when you talk about specific program, now you have to talk to the parent in a way that educates them as to what, what is the difference between, for instance, um, an approach and a program, a scripted program like Wilson or Project Read or any number of you know, programs out there that are Orton-Gillingham based, or some people refer to as Orton-Gillingham based, are structured, sequential, cumulative, um, and work. But they have to be delivered as they're intended to be delivered because they're scripted programs, essentially scripted programs. I'm almost oversimplifying this a lot. Now, if, but if a teacher or an instructor is uh, uh, you know has been properly trained in Orton Gillingham, they have the ability to be both diagnostic and prescriptive, and they can you know, work with the child and develop an approach that is going to meet that child's needs without having to be you rely on the script of a particular program. So you have approach, which is, let's say, an Orton Gilliam, which requires a depth of knowledge for the instructor, and you have a scripted program, such as Wilson or Project Read or, you know, any number of other programs that have to be delivered as they're intended to be delivered. So, and legally, it is up to the school district, the school district to identify the program that they wish to use. The parent does not have that right. Although if you, if you respond to a parent saying that, you know, asking for a particular program by, well, that's not your, you don't have the legal authority to tell us how to teach your child then you're missing the point. You're not, you're not responding to the, to the parent's need. And so in order to be able to respond to their need, you have to educate to them as to what's the difference between scripted programs and approaches. You have to tell them, this is, this is what we have chosen to use. We have found it to be effective and we will monitor progress, just like I said. And if there is a need to change the approach or the intensity, um, then we will do it at an appropriate time. Okay, and then great. only only secondarily, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's not their authority to demand a program. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, what is your opinion on holding children back due to being very far behind? That, you know, that is a, diff that is a difficult question. It, you know, it, it, the culture, I think, has a lot to do with it. I know I was left back. I was left back in the first grade. My brother is a very successful attorney in Florida, and he was left back in the second grade. My mother was left back, et cetera. We all have had uh, you know, issues with respect to learning how to read. And for, for me, it was not difficult because um, it was not, the kind of um, issue that it is today. Today, children, you know, children are identified as being in special education. Um, children are identified as having a learning disability and uh, it is difficult. So very often you can differentiate the educational experience sufficiently to meet the child's needs without the necessity of retaining them in a grade. Now, if it's a very young child, like in kindergarten or first grade, it's possible that the retention would be appropriate under the circumstances, but you've got to look at the emotional as well as the educational goals. Okay, thank you. So that is all the time we have for today, unfortunately. And there are a few more questions coming in the chat. So what I'll do is I will take them down and then I could create a Q&A so that we can attend to those and ask Emerson for his expertise and follow up in our after webinar email to all of you. 
So Emerson, thank you so much for your time today. I want to thank you on behalf of Glean Education, OSPI, and the Structured Literacy within an MTSS Framework Initiative. And thank you to our wonderful attendees who come out and spend time with us after their long day. We look forward to spending with time with you on our next webinar, which is for Sharon Vaughn on January 19th, 2023. Please register for that event. The link is in the chat. Until then, I hope you all have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.